people need to know that their leaders stand with them. They've marched and stood by activists. We still do our jobs and we still show up for our communities. Tonight, questions about whether some elected officials are going too far. Anybody who was hurt needs to sue. We want to utilize their platform in a very, in a very negative way. Tonight, we're going 360. Plus, a murder and a mystery that remains unsolved. This is one of the worst crimes against uh, immigrants and against Muslims in the history of Colorado. Tonight, a reminder of the family from Senegal we lost two months ago today as the hunt for clues and suspects continues. The doctors, the nurses, the first responders, and I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. In the last few hours, the president speaking out from the White House. It's his first night back in four days after leaving Walter Reed Medical Center this evening. His doctors say he's well enough to return, but he's not out of the woods yet. Some health experts believe the president is likely still contagious. The president didn't speak to reporters after his arrival to the White House. He did make a dramatic return without even saying a word, walking up the steps of the White House, facing cameras and taking off his mask. White House leaders are turning the president's map room and diplomatic reception room as remote offices for the president. The president says as our leader, he knows he has to get back to work. Don't let it dominate. Don't let it take over your lives. Don't let that happen. We have the greatest country in the world. We're going back. We're going back to work. We're going to be out front. As your leader, I had to do that. I knew there's danger to it, but I had to do it. It's still not clear what the president's schedule will look like now that he's back in the White House, but the president says he'll be back on the campaign trail soon, and he plans to attend the next presidential debate, which is a week from Thursday. And for now, the president must remain in isolation at least 10 days since symptoms began. That's according to the CDC guidelines. And that means if the president follows those guidelines, by this time next week, he should be out of isolation. Inside the White House, it's now being called its own COVID hotspot. More than a dozen people have tested positive, many linked to last weekend's Rose Garden event for Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett. The latest to test positive today, Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany and two of her press aides. And a reminder, this Friday, Republican Senator Cory Gardner and challenger John Hickenlooper will go head to head in a televised debate. I will be the moderator alongside our colleagues at the Denver Post and Colorado Public Radio. And you can watch it right here on Denver 7. The debate starts at 5 p.m., runs until 6.30. It's been two months to the day since a family of immigrants from Senegal were killed in their Green Valley ranch home. And despite a $40,000 reward for information, investigators are at a standstill. Yeah, there are few leads, and all we know is that three people wearing masks and hoodies, these three are responsible. And tonight, we cannot lose sight of this tragedy in a family who did so much in our community. Jabril Dial, a Colorado State grad who studied civil engineering, who was working on the Central 70 project, his wife who wanted to become a nurse, and their 22-month-old daughter just came to Colorado earlier this year. Jabril's sister, who was working at Amazon, was also killed, along with her eight-month-old daughter, a thriving family taken from this world far too soon. We, we lost people who were really community oriented and who not only cared about themselves but cared about the community and were examples of, of, of the American dream. We're not satisfied and, and every day uh, that goes by and, and these people are still out there, we don't know who could be, who's going to be the next victim. Five precious life was taken away, including babies, babies come forward and just help us solve this crime. Denver police say this case is their top priority. It's possible this family was targeted because of their race or religion. Denver police say even though they haven't found evidence of that, they're not ruling it out either. A Denver man reached out to Contact 7 after he got what he thought was a thank you note in the mail and instead it was a racist rant. There's a lot of white bleeding hearts that feel sorry for you guys, but little do they know that you blacks just want a white woman and mix your race with white people. Randall Williams says his family was targeted because of the Black Lives Matter flag on his Southwest Denver home. And he says the card is just another sign that racism is alive and well and something we need to talk about, which is why he wanted to share his story. I'm a target right now. Like you might not see it in your eyes, but I'm 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 a target. 
and I want to get home safely to my family every day. And this isn't the first time a Black Lives Matter sign has been targeted here in the Denver Metro. A prominent realtor was fired after removing signs in her hilltop neighborhood. And three area churches have had their banners destroyed or stolen. Well, we can't forget these images, thousands taken to the streets over the summer protesting police brutality and racial injustice. And among the crowds marching, elected officials. Some of you have asked, should they be actively participating in these protests? Well, so tonight, Denver 7 investigator Jennifer Kovaleski is going 360. Black Lives Matter! From the streets of Denver. We will not allow this cancer to continue to kill our community! To Aurora City Hall. Black Lives Matter! Local elected leaders are using their own voices to call for change. We want to see police officers being held accountable. They've clashed with police. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They and use megaphones to speak their truth. We're not asking for special treatment. Black people aren't asking for special treatment. We're just asking to be treated like humans. But should those elected into office be actively participating in protests? When does it cross the line? Or does it? In tonight's 360, you'll hear seven different perspectives on the changing landscape of local politics. When I say black lives, you say matters. Let's begin with perhaps the most vocal voice in the debate. Folks are uh, used to the established old guard and we're done with that. Denver School Board Director Tay Anderson is unapologetic about who he is and what he's about. I come out because I want you to understand I'm out here with you. He says voters knew he was an activist when they elected him. Individuals knew who they were voting for. It wasn't a secret. Neither is the fact that some have criticized him for doing it, saying he's too focused on protesting and not focused enough on the school board. I pride myself in as I've never missed a school board meeting. Uh, I've never had to tell folks, no, I'm not coming to this meeting, I'm protesting. I think they know that they're really stretching the boundaries. Aurora Police Union President Mark Sears says they're doing more harm than good. I just think it sends a negative message to their constituents even that have voted for them to be in office and now you're actually breaking the law. He's talking about Aurora Councilwoman Allison Coombs. That's her in the rainbow face covering at a protest for Elijah McClain back in June. What are these people doing wrong right now? Can you come to me? Police body cam video shows Coombs ignoring the officer's orders for several minutes. What are they doing wrong? It's ironic to me that cops break the law, we go to jail. How come elected officials are breaking the law, but they're not going to jail? I think that if they believe they have grounds to charge me with a crime, they should. Councilwoman Coombs says she too was elected as an activist, which she says is part of a growing movement in local politics. We're electing people who rose up into leadership as a result of already being activists. And we're not just gonna leave that behind because we got elected. It would be disingenuous to who we are for us to do so. Coombs says by disobeying the officer's orders to move back, she was taking a stand against an unjust law. And if that's the consequence of standing for people who are saying, stop killing us, get your knee off our necks, then I will take that consequence. She also hopes her activism sends a message to other politicians. I hope that we are creating a culture where political cowardice is not accepted. Really, I think the era of inaction on the part of elected officials is over. Aurora Councilman Juan Marcano was also an activist before getting into politics. He's gone to protests and says he's simply there to listen. I really feel it's my responsibility to go and bear witness to what's actually happening. But what about that Aurora protest in June? When things got ugly. I do not condone property violence, and I especially do not condone violence against other people. And we can't talk about local activism without talking about Denver City Councilwoman Candy C. DeBaca. They don't know sh they do what they're told. That's her on body cam video clashing with police as officers were trying to clear a homeless camp. Sidabaka also took heat for this video she posted on her Facebook page after things calmed down. Anybody who was hurt needs to sue. In it, you can hear the councilwoman encouraging people to sue police. The liability went up after the state law changed. Everybody needs to start suing. Sidabaka defended her actions back in August, saying she was defending her constituents. When they reach out to me, I show up, which is what I thought the job was supposed to be and what I thought 
our mayor and everybody else in our city government signed up to do as well. The councilwoman did not respond to our request for comment for this 360 report, but Denver's mayor had plenty to say after it happened. I don't think in the, the entire time I've been on, on, in government, uh, I have seen anything that has disturbed me more. Mayor Hancock called her behavior as an elected leader troubling. And when I heard uh, her voice, um, I just, I ju it just sank. It, it, it just, I could not believe that a public official was doing what is uh, happening on that video. Taking this 360 full circle. But it's almost certainly the largest social movement in U.S. history. DU political scientist Laurel Eckhouse says historically protesting is seen as an outsider strategy, meaning those who protest typically don't have access to political power. It might seem a little bit strange to have insiders, right, elected officials joining those outsider strategies. But it's clear the number's growing as many of those we vote into office find their participation is the best way to hear the concerns of those they represent. Politicians uh, coming to believe that the protesters are important constituents for them, that they're not niche. Making the question of how far is too far a new consideration for you, the voter, as well. I'm Denver 7 investigator Jennifer Kowaleski. And listen, if we missed your perspective in our reporting, we want to hear it. Please email us 360 at the Denver Channel .com, or you can always weigh in right now on the Denver 7 Facebook page. That's concerning for us. Trying to sneak by managers and avoid public health orders, little mask wearing, unless they're called out. To the point that sometimes I start to walk up and I hear, oh, here she comes, here she comes, mask. Tonight, the manager at Urban Putt says some unabiding customers are putting their business at risk. I don't want to have to tell people to keep their masks on. Still an awful lot of smoke in our skies across much of Colorado, but there is some rain and snow in the seven days.